Greetings, my name is Cody Cook, and you're listening to Cantus Firmus at the Movies. And uh, this time we're talking about the 1946 Frank Capra film, It's a Wonderful Life. Capra, who, uh, of course, also directed Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, Mr. Deeds Goes to Town, and the Why We Fight series of war films. And uh, my guest this time around is Kevin Payton. Kevin is the executive director of Joshua's Place, which is a community outreach organization in South Lebanon, Ohio, that serves as a food pantry, but also builds relationships by meeting more than just material needs. Joshua's Place is connected with the Village Community Church in South Lebanon, which Kevin pastors. Uh, and Kevin wears a lot of hats. He's also an entrepreneur and restaurant developer, which I think gives him some useful and unique insights into a film like this one, which deals with the spiritual and moral components of how we use and value wealth. So, Kevin, thank you for, for taking some time to be here to talk with us. Uh, thanks, Cody. Glad to be here. Appreciate you asking me to do it. Yeah. So, um, real quick, I'll, I'll just kind of get, for, for those who haven't seen the film, I'll, I'll get a little cast and plot, light, li plot outline out of the way. So first of all, we have the uh, uh, inimitable, although he's often imitated, Jimmy Stewart uh, playing George Bailey. Uh, and, and actually, real quick, what are your thoughts on Jimmy Stewart? He's kind of um, um, sort of a controversial figure nowadays. It used to be he was pretty well loved by everybody, but now some people find him a little annoying, I think, with the unique voice and that kind of thing. Yeah. No, I, I, I think he's perfect for this film. Uh, you know, I... I mm -hmm. We were not, I'm not a huge movie buff in terms of following characters and actors, uh, those kind of things. Uh, but uh, but I like Jimmy Stewart. Too. Yeah, I, I think he's. I love listening to him. My wife can't stand him. And um, <laughs> uh, but you know, I, I, I uh, there's a story I heard uh, Rich Little, the uh, comedian and, and uh, uh, mimic, tell uh, about Jimmy Stewart. Because his you know, that used to sell the maps to the stars' houses and that kind of thing and do the celebrity tours in Hollywood. And so everybody knew where Jimmy Stewart lived. So uh, Rich Little asked him if there was there were ever issues with that, with people just sort of showing up because Jimmy Stewart didn't have security or you know fences up or anything like that. And uh, and Jimmy Stewart said, "Oh well, yeah, yeah, sometimes." And he says, "Well, well, you know, can you give me an example?" And he said, "Well, uh, one time a truck pulled up and a family got out and started having a picnic on my front lawn." And Rich said, "Oh, did you you know get out there and tell them to leave?" And he said, "Oh no, no, I, I couldn't have done that." He said, well, did you, did you call the police on him? He said, oh, oh, no, 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 I couldn't have done that either. So, so what did you do? Well, I, I went out back and I, I turned on the sprinkler. Uh, anyway, I thought that was a funny story. But um, it's okay. So Jimmy Stewart plays uh, George Bailey, um, the main character, the protagonist. Are you going to use that act? Are you going to use the, uh, the impression throughout this? Was, was no, I, I, got it, I got it out of the way early. Uh, okay. But if, if you want to try one, too, you're welcome to at this point. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so Jimmy Stewart plays George Bailey. Uh, his wife Mary Hatch Bailey is played by Donna Reed. Uh, Clarence Oddbody, which is of uh, is, is a, I think supposed to be a joke name, uh, is the angel. Uh, Clarence the angel is also known by, as uh, played by Henry Travers and um, Lionel Barrymore <laughs> plays Henry Potter. Lionel Barrymore, of course, from uh, Broadway and, and film, uh, kind of a well known in that Barrymore family. So the, the basic plot here, for those who haven't seen it, and um, if you haven't seen it yet, you should go ahead and watch it because it's on Amazon Prime right now as we're recording this. Uh, and it's, you know, kind of a, a classic film. Uh, so, you know, you got you to go, go out of your way to, to watch it. So the, the idea here is that uh, George Bailey is a man who's lived his life sacrificing for others, and yet he finds himself contemplating suicide. The prayers of his friends and neighbors go up to heaven and a, uh, you know, kind of dopey but well-meaning angel named Clarence is given background on George to prepare him to intervene. We learn that George lost his hearing in one ear as a boy, saving his brother from drowning, that he stopped his pharmacist boss as a child uh, from administering uh, medicine, a poison as medicine accidentally, and that he gave up his hopes to see the world in order to take over the building and loan uh, uh business when his father died and this is a building and loan that was the town's only buffer between hard-working poor folks and the machinations of unscrupulous banker henry potter who just usually goes by the name mr potter throughout the film uh, after george's uncle billy misplaces eight thousand dollars of the building and loans money and potter finds it the future of george as well as the building and loan are in jeopardy due to george's life insurance policy he's worth more to his family in dollars anyway alive than dead or sorry dead than alive rather uh, as he contemplates suicide clarence the angel intervenes george tells clarence he wishes he had never been born so clarence arranges to show him what his town of bedford falls would look like if that had never happened thus we learn that it is indeed a wonderful life uh, at least for george so th that's the, the basic outline and 
uh, you and I had talked about this. Neither one of us had really seen this all the way through until recently. And, and part of the reason I think for that is it's kind of an odd film. It doesn't, if you start early, like kind of from the beginning, it doesn't always grab you. It's it's, it's strange, right? Yeah, I, I, I described it. I, I don't think I had ever seen the opening scene where the uh, the two the, the, in the heavenly scene where they were talking to each other it it reminded me of kind of a Mork and Mindy opening <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it's not the first time I thought I might have come upon like a spoof version of the film and uh, and, and then realized it was uh, it was actually the real film and so yeah it was uh, seeing it through its entirety was a little odd I'd seen I, I know I'd seen the entire movie most of it uh, several times uh, but just recently watched it beginning to end uh, which was a fun experience. Yeah, I, I watched it for the first time all the way through this month, and I would started it probably twice before and just never I, – I, I think just early on it didn't grab me. There's kind of the, the, the angel scene, you're talking about the angels in the sky, and they're talking, but there, it's actually just stars moving around. Right, yeah. uh, and it's kind of yeah. ugly, and it's it's, it's, it's yeah. weird. Then yet is, I've not watched it in color, I think, which I think would be interesting oh. with the colorization, but I, I'm imagining uh, it probably doesn't help a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I'm kind of a stickler for for not colorizing movies that were filmed in black and white. I mean, partly because that was, you know, it's lit a certain way for black and light. Black and white, the director has a certain vision as he's seeing it. So I, I, I kind of, I sort of hated that whole colorization movement that happened in the '80s and '90s, where everything was was colorized. But, uh, but yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, and I think you and I talked about too. There's this scene, um, one of the flashback scenes, where they're at the high school dance, where he gets romantically connected with Mary, his future wife, and uh, there's like this, they have this, the the where they're dancing is actually like a cover for a, a pool, so it's they're like it's a double. It's actually a high school gym, right? Yeah, and they've got this pool underneath. Yeah, right. It's somebody. Somebody pull, uh, clicks the button and the, and the floor opens and they start falling in and jumping into the pool that's underneath the floor. Uh, it, I don't know that I'd ever seen that. Uh, in, in my reading, I, I researched it and that was an actual high school in Beverly Hills that re really existed at the time. So I'm curious to see if that was, you know, something they just, it was, a, it was an opportunistic uh, addition to the movie. I, I, I'm not certain it wasn't in the original book, but it was it was definitely an odd part. I'm not sure that it really fit in the story. It was interesting. Yeah, I, I love the, uh, there's a little throwaway bit there where um, he kind of takes Mary away from this sort of obnoxious guy who's trying to talk to her. And uh, he's, you know, George comes over and he starts trying to, this kid starts chatting up both of them. And, and George says, why don't you stop annoying me? And the kid goes, well, I'm sorry. Hey, <laughs> it's, it's, it's like so sticky. Was, was that right before the lasso of the moon scene? Uh, yeah, I think that's is that that's I think that's when they're outside after the uh, after the dance, right? And they're walking. He's walking her home. Yeah, yeah. And, I think you, know, you could use the word cheesy a lot uh, by today's standards, and I think you know by how we describe things today, there was a, seemed to be a lot of overacting. Uh, mm. You know, but I think it was timely. You know, for for the time for for the era, it was there. Uh, but uh, uh, interestingly, and I, I had no idea until. Uh, I think, well, you know, we, we use this as a, uh, as a catalyst for a sermon series in our, in our church mm. and, so, and some research. And it was surprising to me that it was actually a, a, a disappointment. Um, uh, the, it was a, a film, a financial flop initially, and it wasn't until it had fallen out of copyright uh, in the 70s and 80s that it began to pick up steam and uh, begin to be, become the cult following that it is now. But uh, uh, looking back, I could see that. It was a little, you know, almost predictable in some places in the movie. Yeah, well, and I think we have this this reading of like films of this era as being kind of hokey and sentimental, and that's not necessarily the case. I mean, Capra certainly is, is nothing if not a sentimentalist, but um, and but sometimes it you know that works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, I think for the most part, it works and it's a wonderful life. What what were your thoughts on that? Yeah, it does, and, and and it makes more sense to me. Uh, having read, you know, Capper's motivation, uh, he had bought the, the the rights to the book, uh, uh, the greatest gift. Uh, he, I think he, the, he he bought the rights to the book, changed some significant pieces of it, but his motivation for making the film in that time was, uh, by his quote, to combat the atheism in Hollywood. Uh, mm. That he had felt like there was, you know, a, beginning to be a shift of morality in Hollywood. 
Um, and he, he explicitly talked about issues of homosexuality, nudity, uh, the, the perversions of Hollywood. And he felt like movies like this needed to stand in competition to that. And so uh, obviously put him on the outside of the circle, um, you know, from kind of moving forward. But uh, uh, he had a he had a, uh, an altruistic uh, motivation beyond making money uh, or so he claims. I think the interview that I read was from the 70s. So it was mm -hmm. a look back on his motivation. Yeah, and this whole idea of kind of combating atheism is interesting because, um, you know, obviously this is a film where there is a universe that where angels and, and God exists, but it's not distinctly Christian. Um, yeah, right. And it, it kind of brings to mind um, uh, President Eisenhower's statement uh, that uh, our government makes no sense unless it's founded on a deeply felt religious faith, and I don't care what it is. Uh, yeah. But there's this this kind of uh, you know, this 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 term kind of cropped up around that time period of the judeo-christian civilization right yeah um and it's like you know you sort of boil uh you, you sort of take theism and you, you boil it down to its essentials and then you you know if you can fit jesus in here or there that's fine but it's not necessary Which um, is because you know if you think about the work he had done for the u.s government capra on the mm -hmm. why we fight, you know, it, he, he had this you know, almost utilitarian view of his work as opposed to, you know, you would expect more of a creative motivation. Uh, and so, you know, whether it's kind of making the case for war uh, and helping motivate troops for the, uh, the you know, why they fight, uh, or in this case, uh, to take on a more religious perspective and giving a defense to a supernatural uh, presence. Uh, it, it, you know, it's just it's interesting to me to see him uh, kind of see his work through that lens, as opposed to what tend to hear from folks in this realm is it's more artistic and more creative. It's more expressive uh, of that outcome. Mm -hmm. it seemed to be okay with the fact that it had a job to do. Yeah, which is not to say that it's it's not well made. I mean, you certainly, um, you know, it, it's it's a it's a very well made movie, and you, there's no artistic flaws with it necessarily but but yeah he is you know he has a point of view that he's he's i think trying to get across the um it's interesting to me because I, it, it would look to me like kind of um an expression of american populist religion um so you have like these elements of providence and you know american exceptionalism a little bit the the angels seem kind of keenly interested in and in, uh, america's military foreign policy and that kind of stuff and <laughs> uh, supportive of it um, and, and this sort of concern for the working man. Right. Um, but I, I don't remember, you know, like Jesus coming up apart from an illusion uh, in a rousing chorus of Hark the Herald Angels Sing. He's, he's kind of referenced there. But, um, but yeah, it, well, it's, it, in my mind, there's this, you know, there's this, there's this kind of messianic archetype that happens. Like, so, so you can kind of say George Bailey has this, you know, kind of neo type, you know, he, he's the sacrificial you know, personality. He, he takes the smack from the the pharmacist without you know he doesn't he doesn't respond in that way and so there's some of that I, I don't think it's well done necessarily but I think you can kind of pick up on some of that imagery but I'm like you it's not really all that spiritual of a movie in, in its overtones um, I think to me it's interesting to see it's it's much more uh, cultural you know that way mm -hmm. it talks a lot about the underdog um, seems to be much more about uh, um, the uh, kind of the moral hazards of not of, of socioeconomic differences. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it takes a little bit of shots at capitalism. You know, if you, I mean, it paints Potter almost exclusively as evil uh, in the banking and financial system, which of course, you know, this would have been post depression era. Uh, and so I'm imagining the, uh, the country's perspective on banks would have been pretty negative at that time. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting to me to watch this kind of the, 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 the moral play on a bank, on a on a building and loan versus a bank you know and you know had, had we applied that to the 1980s version of a savings and loan versus a bank and all the corruption that surrounded that you know it's just it's interesting to kind of pull things that we call evil out of the of the subset of when it was created and, and watch how we respond to it but in this movie the building and loan was the good uh, organization uh, the bank was the bad, although the bank was necessary for the building and loan to exist. So. Yeah, yeah, it's almost like maybe today we'd compare like a credit union to like a big, you know, right. multinational bank or something like that. Credit unions are working man's tool. The the big banks, Citibank, is for the evil, you know. So, uh, uh, so, but it was, you know, to to me, it, to be 
to be so pro-American in these points. He was fairly, you know, not anti-democrat or uh, capitalist, but uh, was not favorable to the to the capitalistic process. In a lot of these somewhat, yeah. I mean, it's it's kind of um, I think he takes a somewhat more nuanced view, I guess. But it's like, um, I, I I'd read um. Uh, kind of in preparation for this, I, I came across a uh, what I thought was kind of a tone deaf review um, of the film that chided it for its quote socialist economics, uh, and paralleled it with the uh, the Green New Deal, um, which hopes to quote limit economic prosperity in the name of a better environment end quote. Uh, you know, and it, it it kind of felt like it could have been a a review written by Mr. Potter, but <laughs> or maybe Ayn Rand or somebody. Uh, it's interesting that you call it tone deaf because I, I, in my view of it, I saw a little bit of that. You know, mm -hmm. I, I saw a little bit of a, you know, a way to, you know, there, there, there are things that Potter offered to this that I that weren't purely that, that are necessary parts of free enterprise mm -hmm. that that the film made as inherently bad, right? Uh, and so uh, there, there, there were ways to deal with the inequity of credit, inequity of, uh, you know, so. Where you know we would we would look at it today and say, hey, it's not okay for a working man without good credit to buy a house. Instead, mm -hmm. they, Potter he would he would use you know racial slurs like garlic eaters, and you know if he if he just chooses to play pool with a local employee, we'll give him a loan, you know. And so there was this you know this, this idealism that credit and banking should be based more on uh, familiarity uh, than the fact of you know the ability to pay back. Uh, and so to me, in my mind, I hear a little bit of that socialism, socialistic viewpoint that wants to level the playing field, which is not necessarily a bad thing, uh, mm -hmm. but it, in my mind, it, it's got a little bit of that there. So I don't, I don't disagree with the, the, the article that you read entirely. Well, so, yeah, and I think you talked about the, um, the sort of stereotypical language of Potter, which I think that's kind of where it really comes down to because, um, you know, George's, his argument is, well, they're hardworking and, you know, every so often there may be a struggle here, whatever to pay. And, and we, you know, we, we extend a little bit of patience, but these, these, these are men who are hardworking and have good character. And so I think, but, but ultimately the, he's not, you know, getting rich off these guys like Potter is, okay. you know, P P Potter isn't going to, uh, you know, give anybody anything that he can't collect a significant dividend on. Right. Well, um, and, I, and I think to me, that's where the divergence of, of the morality is between the two characters, because in the sense, they're doing the exact same job. Right. Mm -hmm. so, so they're both in the business of giving people money they don't have, mm -hmm. uh, how they give for those folks the money they don't have and whom they give it to is where the differences come in. And so and, and, and the money that's left over for me to keep at the end of that. So Potter believes that his role uh, is to do that based on certain criteria that leaves him more money at the end, which is ultimately control. Uh, George uh, does it for the idea of growing the end user without leaving money for himself at the end, which is more of the more nonprofit base. And so um, I, I think to me that distinction from the from the from the commercial side of this, I mean, you know, the, the enterprise side of it is the most interesting. And I think it, that that is worthwhile, to, you know, and, and I think that's why both should exist in the economy. Uh, but I, it, to me, I think it's 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 interesting and timely because of the time in the air when you think about what was happening in the 30s and 40s, having coming out, having come out of the Great Depression, yeah. you, know, you know, swaths of wealth had just moved into the hands of a very few people. Uh, and so no doubt that played to an audience that had felt like, hey, we really got the screws put to us. And there are still just a very few people that have most of the money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, um, the, the, the FBI actually at the time had suspected the film of being um, communist propaganda um, yeah. because it, they, they saw its portrayal of bankers as Scrooge, tri Scrooge types and saw this as like a, a quote, a common trick used by, uh, used by communists. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, the casting of Potter, literally, you know, from the Christmas Carol, the guy that had played the Scrooge was probably. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. I'm sure that had an impact. Yeah. It, well, and, you know, I, I think I, I, I agree with you that there's, there's kind of a populist economics at play here that I think you sort of see still today and, in, in, um, particularly like in, in sort of Trump's base where there may be a somewhat of a naivete about economics. Right. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, one of the things I, I, I'd heard, um, uh, your, your first sermon on, um, making connections about the film related to money uh, and George's view of money 
versus uh, Mr. Potter's view of money. Um, and and it, seemed, it seemed to me that the, the film wasn't necessarily trying to address capitalism or even banks. I mean, you know, Bailey's also a banker, as you'd mentioned. Yeah. But it, it's the attitude uh, toward money um, and, and this connection with hoarding or exploitation. And, you know, George, at one point in the film, is, is staring at a portrait of his father. And it's kind of a, a quick moment that you could miss. But underneath this portrait of his father in his office is this sign that says, all you can take with you is that which you have given away. Right. Yeah. Um, but but it, I'd be interested in hearing you kind of talk a little bit about these these two different attitudes toward money and, and, and where you saw, you know. Well, and it's... That. And that's what I love about the movie, and, and you, you outlined in your uh, your introduction to me the, the roles that I live in, both as leader in the uh, the world of faith and as a leader in the world of business. Um, those things collide on a regular basis, uh, and obviously, uh, the what what truly leads us is the the, the, the scriptural and the biblical, and I and I think uh, that is where the movie gets it right. Uh, is that it, it, it really it it, it it gets to the issues of attitude and heart uh, about how we see money and our attitude towards money and what is the purpose of fiat currency uh, and the differences between, you know, and, and distribution and how, how do we give it away? I, I think the problem is, is from the economic side, is we tend to look at it more binary, you know, is it socialism or is it capitalism? Uh, and that ridiculous conversation that people want to get caught up into about, you know, what politics Jesus would have, what economics Jesus would have, you know, all of those kind of ridiculous conversations. Um, but ultimately, I think the movie did a great job of kind of challenging all of us at a heart level and say, what, what does money mean to us? In the end, it was money that was the salvation, right? It was the community coming together uh, and giving uh, the money to George. Interestingly, the, the most disappointing part to me, there was no justice for Potter. The mm -hmm. movie ends without really ever dealing with the fact that Potter knew he had the money. He stole the money. He, he you know, he completely fabricated this idea that George had done something irreputable with the money and the movie ended without ever dealing with that. And so part of, you know, my sense of justice wasn't satisfied <laughs> with the, with, with Clarence getting his wings as the, as the conclusion. Sure. You might, you might want to follow this movie up with something like a uh, Charles Bronson and death wish. Something <laughs> along those lines. Uh, it comes out of retirement and, and <laughs> makes things. Right. Um, yeah. So, the, the, I, I, yeah, the thing about Potter and Injustice, though, uh, there is this connection here with, um, you know, the problem of evil. And, and there's a lot that you can say about that. And there's a lot of answers that have been given to that problem. And, and most of them probably have at least some basis in truth. But I think for, for this discussion, I, I'd be interested in narrowing the focus to this issue of when God chooses to intervene. Mm -hmm. um, I think most Christians can point to moments where they felt that God's intervention in their lives was apparent and also times when it wasn't and they wished it was. And in George Bailey's life, as we watch this film, we could imagine a number of other occasions when we, when, when Clarence could have come down and fixed the situation. And so the, the questions we, we often struggle with uh, as believers, uh, this particular question is, you know, okay, God, I know you're there. I know you're, uh, you've intervened in history and even in my own life, but why aren't you intervening right now? And uh, that, that issue sort of comes up as you watch the film. You know, you think, okay, well, why didn't Clarence come in and, and uh, find a way of, of pinning this on Potter? Or why did he not stop Uncle Billy from losing the money to begin with? You know, why is it that he, he intervenes right here? Sure, yeah. Yeah, well, and, you know, and it, it, it certainly, it, it strikes at our need and desire to, to understand. And, to, and in some ways, that you know, obviously time is a function of control. And so here we are we're talking about issues of control. And so many times my questions about God and his timing are my issues about my control and why he's, he's let me down with my expectation of his timing and my limited understanding of what the benefit of his movement is. And so, you know, then, then we get off in the discussions about trying to guess God's motivation and God's intent. And uh, uh, that's a, it's, it's a, you know, it, it can be a difficult walkthrough. I think for, 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 for the purposes of the movie, you know, as you talk about, where where this falls into uh, to 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 benefit George Bailey, I you know it's it's my belief that the you know and I don't know that this was the the original intent of the writer, but but I believe there's a message here not just of money but of community, uh, and as it relates to God's intent to to use the uh, his hands and feet, you know, and so in the metaphor that I would choose most often, which would be the local church, um, to express His will uh, and His benefit to the world, uh, and so. 
uh, in that way, I think the movie parallels um, everything that God can do supernaturally, but in the end chooses to allow others to be benefit uh, as part of that uh, uh, solution. And so that's to me, that's intriguing uh, that it wasn't just a miraculous $8,000 that ended up um, uh, or that, you know, at the instant that, uh, uh, you know, wacky Billy figured out he lost the money that he instantly remembered, you know, he put it in the paper and would have resolved everything, but that bad things continued to happen. God's will was expressed through a community of people that loved, you know, uh, George, um, that, oh, by the way, was the opening expression and question of the movie, which was the prayers of the townspeople asking yeah. to move, right? And so, and the end of the movie is bookended with the townspeople uh, uh, being the, the solution to their own prayer, uh, which was the money that had gone missing. Yeah, and I, I like this idea of participation, and I, I do see that as is another one of those kind of partial answers to this issue of the problem of evil, where we sort of find ourselves in situations where we have to choose to do something ourselves. And, and, and that's, I think often a misunderstanding of prayer. Um, and you see a lot of skeptics who will mock Christians for, uh, you know, sending thoughts and prayers when, you know, something terrible happens. Right. Uh, and, but, 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 but the reality is that prayer is the beginning of participation. In, in a lot of cases, it's, it's basically me saying, you know, God, I'm expressing my concerns and my desires to you that you would intervene. And also, by the way, what can I do? And can you prepare my heart to, to, to do whatever is necessary in the situation? And without specific denominational commitments, I think the movie hits the highlights of that, you know, as you think about the natural and the supernatural, uh, as it begins with the created, the, you know, the individual townspeople laying up prayers for a lot, someone they loved, you know, because they believe that there's something as individual as an individual praying for George Bailey, I do not have the ability to solve his problem. So I access the supernatural and, 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 and presume that God has the answer to this. Well, then there's another supernatural activity that happens through the angelic, the movement of God's warriors and all of this. The theology gets messy from there. Again, we'll get into that. Um, and then ultimately, it's the it's the coming together of the angelic and those who are part of the community that the very community that we're, that we're praying for George that are part of that solution. Uh, and all of that is a reflection of God's will and God's movement. If you want to, you know, kind of use it metaphorically. Yeah. Well, and and you said maybe maybe not to get into the the angel angelic issues, but uh, the angelology of the film, so to speak. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I think we could for a minute um, the. So there's obviously this this issue that you know Clarence is a former human who dies and becomes an angel and is working on trying to get his wings by uh, accomplishing these good deeds, um, which obviously is not biblical. So you know, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, if if you know someone you care about dies, it's not because God needed another angel. You know, he's he's got enough angels and humans don't become angels. That's not part of the deal. Um, but the um, thing is, you you and I make light of that, but in my you know the past decade of pastoring um that 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 is a common belief system yeah. I mean, that, that that is damaging you know that's laughable at some level when, when it's so easily you know spoken against so clearly exposed as not helpful and not truthful um but films like this perpetuate that and, and yeah. we believe it and, and 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 that begins to undermine our ability to under to see what prayer really is so i'm sorry go ahead i know it, well it, maybe before we, we get onto the angelology thing um, we were kind of talking about this this issue of when God doesn't choose to intervene, and and I think that you know you as a pastor, you, you you were sort of talking about it, hearing people say things like, well, maybe God needed another angel or something. But as you um, you know see people who are struggling because of you know loss of family members or even children to illness or drug addiction or whatever the case may be, um, is it, are, what are you know what are some of the things that um, I mean, what do you even say to somebody uh, in a situation that's struggling like that and wondering, you know, where God is in that situation? Sure. Well, I mean, you know, the, obviously the, the, the first and best answer is there is no one answer. And so yeah. I, I'm always quick to relieve myself of that responsibility. But I, I do believe uh, uh, that there is perspective that offers uh, 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 re re so, some, some relief to it because you know, we, we tend to see all these things, suffering, hurt, disease, death, um, through the limited perspective of our own understanding and through the limited time frame of the time that we see, 
without a full understanding of the supernatural and the eternal. Uh, and so um, all of those limits put us in a position to where we, you know, as that comes into an emotional uh, acute event, like a death of a loved one, we're quick to grab onto a quick answer like, okay, God needed a whatever versus a, you know, in the, in, in, in the, in the realm of eternity where we, God works outside of time and him understanding the multiplicity of benefit for whatever this is, um, this is exactly the right thing to be happening. While in the short term, you know, Apostle Paul talks a lot about suffering and how uh, the, the suffering that we endure now is compared to nothing to the glory that we'll realize later. But none of us really have the ability to be able to, to fully realize that. And so the battle in those perceptions and those discussions is trying to step outside of our own experience and our own emotional moment at the time to do that, which is impossible. I mean, you really can't do it. However, um, a, a better understanding of the supernatural and the eternal is helpful. Uh, and so um, I tend to uh, try to try to direct people that way, uh, you know, and, uh, depending on their theological beliefs about what eternity is like and the access to the eternal uh, to see this separation, not as permanency. Uh, but uh, obviously that's, you know, a, 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 with the assumption that that person, of course, died in Christ. And so um, it's it's much harder. And I've done way too many of these. Of funerals of people I have no idea who they are, what their spiritual existence was. It was a sudden death, usually overdose in the community that we work in. That's not an uncommon thing for me to come across. Uh, and I'm left without specific comfort, but only can speak to the general grace of God. Uh, and so those are the most difficult ones uh, because I'm not able to offer up anything more than just the broad sense of who God is and the character of God. Um, but uh, I, I know that leaves people wanting. So, oh yeah, it's a struggle. Yeah, and I think that's that's the gap of faith. I mean, there's this you know common mis uh, statement of faith, uh, or I think Twain said it that you know faith is uh, believing what you know ain't so. Um, <laughs> or, but you know, in reality, f faith is essentially the choice to fill in the gap between what you do know and what you fail to understand. Right. And so, you know, for, for someone like George Bailey, who's had this, you know, pretty interesting, miraculous experience of God at one point in his life, you know, he, he, he's how, however old he is at this time. And he has this experience of God that he hasn't really had prior to that. Yeah. And but, you know, presumably as he goes through life, he's going to have more struggles. There's going to be more things that happen that are going to challenge his uh, ability to trust in God. But he'll always have that one experience and, and I think for, for most of us who are Christians anyway, we have at least one experience like that. We have this moment where either God saved us or we felt that God's intervention was so palpable that it's hard to deny. Yeah. But then we struggle with that gap. Okay, so God did this thing that was wonderful, but then he let my child die. Right. And so, you know, you, you use faith to fill in that gap, I right. think, sometimes. Yeah. I mean, this this idea of God's goodness and character through the lens of my idea of what that ought to look like, uh, and uh, and that's where I believe you know the it, it, and, and again depending on the maturity and, and the belief system of those you're working with, uh, the, the scriptures offer so much uh, support and help for that in terms of perspective uh, to be able to offer up some ancient truths that are that are pretty rock solid, but. Not everyone's there. Not everyone's in a place where they're, you know, point of understanding or receivership or belief that that's really uh, relevant. And so, um, yeah, it's a it's 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 a hard thing to uh, to grab onto. And I think for you know for uh, uh, for, for George Bailey, uh, uh, the you know the, the the interesting thing about the uh, the original book was called The Greatest Gift. And my assumption was the greatest gift was. Uh, that he'd been given a, a chance to see his the, the world without him. To me, that would be an interesting gift to see. Like, if I had never existed, what would the world look like? Uh, in fact, uh, in my reading, that it was the greatest gift was he was given his life back, uh, which makes sense too. Uh, but I think there's something there about if we, with whatever decision, whatever problem, whatever hurt we're up against, if we were given the full view of the opposite, uh, mm. then how much would that change our perception, our grief, our hurt? Um, if we had that ability to do that, someday we will, I believe, but just not now. Uh, and so that's the faith component of, of waiting. And, uh, uh, and we also know we did a, a, a the, the, we, we did a talk about money as it relates to the film. We also did a talk about why good things happen to bad people. I'm sorry, why bad things happen to good people. Uh, and the opening part, and I didn't teach that message, but the opening part of that was, you know, 
what, what's your belief about the character of God? You know, and, and I believe that question begins that uh, uh, you know, all, all opinion and belief kind of stem from that understanding, which is not necessarily stable. That That's a fluid belief system, you know, impacted by events and understanding and, and life and age. Um, but uh, when you get into these really hard questions about things like that, uh, ultimately it does become a question of God's character and what I believe about. Well, I love how you, you broadened that out to talking about perspective in general, that what George gets is a, a bigger perspective, because I think if you focus in on just that, that one thing that he's able to see, it occurs to me that, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, I, I wonder if I were given, a, if, if I were, you know, contemplating suicide, never given a vision of the world without me, and I took a look at it, and it looked a little bit better, um, <laughs> you know, not because I'm necessarily a terrible person, but, you know, there's all these things that happen. Yeah, but but I like the idea of broadening it to, to, to having perspective in general. Um, I like that that idea. Well, and, and all these things that have happened. So leading up to this moment where Clarence intervenes, if he, at most points, if he had intervened earlier, um, there would be things that wouldn't have happened because George would have been somewhere else or not alive or doing something different. Yeah. And so, you know, George's participation and his existence and his participation in the lives of all these people has makes this town a better a better town you know he, he sort of stands in the gap between these people and potter to give them you know so they're not living in in a you know a, a, you know a nasty you know town filled with prostitution and, and alcoholism and slums and that kind of thing yeah. um and so you know at, at all these points that you know uh clarence could have intervened it, it's perhaps better that george was just the person that he was that he is standing in the gap um but yeah um so okay Okay, but real quick, just back to the angel thing. So obviously this idea of uh, humans becoming angels is not biblical, but if you you know twist this and look at it a different way, um, there is something um, uh, slightly biblical about about this idea because uh, you know the angelic beings are are these sort of sons of God who God places over the world. And, and in, in the New Testament, we sort of read that that God's human family uh, is will sort of displace, uh, these sons of God. So, but at the same time, we're, we're different categories of beings. It's not like angels are just the spirits of dead humans, but but we are brought in to participate uh, in this sort of heavenly family of God. Um, we, we would rule over angels. It would be the reference I think you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and so, but but that kind of brings us back to this idea of participation. That um, you know, we as Protestants try to. Um, uh, and maybe the, partly this is the influence of Calvin, but I think it's also the fact that we don't like supernatural things too much. Um, we try to, um, you know, take down the, the number of divine beings uh, to just one. So we, we really don't like the idea of angels and all these kinds of things. So we have, you know, this one God uh, and he's sovereign. And so, you know, our, our participation is also minimized in that. Um and, but but the reality is that you have these angelic beings, and not all of them are are, are uh, you know working for God. <laughs> but their participation is important. God could do everything He wanted by fiat, but He creates human beings and angels, and the participation of all these beings is essential to the plan and purposes that God has. And so we can't just sort of step mm -hmm. aside and say, well, whatever God wills is what God wills. Okay. We have an obligation. And, and, and add to the mix of that, that in both of these created beings seems to be an ability to express will, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, it, it, you're right. It, it, it hadn't, you know, having not thought about it that way, it, it does it does add to a messier understanding of faith and outcomes, right? Uh, because yeah. if, I, if, if I exclude my belief to down to just one, you know, the, just the singular monotheistic belief of God, even if I get my trinity down to one, view, uh, then it's simple, right? Uh, uh, but if this is about God's will being expressed through the movement of the Holy Spirit, through the salvation of the saints, through the intervention of the angelic, uh, uh, then it, it requires me to participate in my uh, own salvation, to work out my own salvation, right? Uh, and then I'm not just a byproduct, um, uh, well, maybe predestined at some level, uh, for salvation, that I have a say uh, in the outcomes of the world around me, uh, and I have a say uh, in my participation of God's use of me uh, as a believer. Uh, and and uh, I think sometimes that's a more dangerous belief system uh, because it requires my availability. Uh, and 
um, availability isn't something in the Western American world in 2018 that people are willing to give up. Yeah. So, and, and perhaps another way to think about it here um, is that it's a wonderful life because our decisions matter because God has given us the ability to participate in his purposes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way of thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and, and, and the critics on the other side would, would want to, to, to make that sound as if we don't believe God is sovereign. God is absolutely sovereign. Uh, I, I, I don't would, would never take, take anything away from that belief system. However, uh, I, I believe in his sovereignty. He exercises his, uh, uh, his, his, his expression of love in us that we, we get to participate in that. Those, those townspeople that brought the money to, to George's house were an expression of the miraculous will of God. Uh, Absolutely. It looked very practical. It looked very, some. It looked very, you know, uh, physical. But it was a miraculous movement of of, of God's will. Uh, and also, presumably, the result of their prayer. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. So, okay. So, I want to start wrapping things up a little bit here. Um, so, are you you're doing one more sermon on um, "It's a Wonderful Life"? Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. And not surprisingly, I'm talking about community. Okay. So what are some of the things that you're going to sort of highlight there? So just, you know, I think you're still working that out probably a little bit, but yeah, yeah, no, I've, we've, we've, I've got the content mostly uh, outlined and talking about, but I'm, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the communal nature of God, uh, how that being made in his image, uh, that, uh, what we see in the film was reflective of our image bearers of God, uh, and the, the townspeople's reaching out on behalf of their friend, George is reflective of, uh, what is natural to all of us, that's the care and love for each other. Um, and that uh, just to what I said to you, that t- tomorrow's talk will begin with the townspeople's prayer. It'll end uh, with uh, the townspeople's miracle. Uh, and coincidentally, this is being taped on the 22nd of December, the 23rd of December. We take up our annual offering for the poor in our church tomorrow. Uh, and so uh, we will be, uh, we will have our chance uh, to be the miracle to our community uh, in the same way. So um, what, what I'll go ahead and do is um, I'll, I'll provide a, a link to the uh, the Facebook page. I know you guys do sermons, um, publish the sermons on Facebook. So if anybody wanted to uh, check that out, they could do that. Are there, are there any other uh, like social media or website information I, I, uh, you'd like me to pass along? Yeah, probably Facebook would be the best way. It's usually we can get the, ser- the sermons live at. Uh, of course, the, uh, our, the Joshua's Place website is joshuasplace.cc. The church's website is thevillagechurch.cc. Uh, and so you can find us there. Yeah, and, and you guys are expanding Joshua's place. You already you have like two campuses essentially for that now, and yeah. you're looking to do more of that, right? Yeah, so, yeah, so we've got a belief that uh, um, that the church uh, has uh, a lot to offer uh, this issue of folks that are struggling, uh, and that it's way more than just food, uh, and that uh, we're focused on uh, adult development, child engagement, and addiction recovery, uh, and that in our culture today, people tend to identify mostly by school district. Uh, and so the plan and strategy is to grow uh, the movement uh, by school district. Uh, and uh, our uh, first goal is to be in every school district in the county that we exist in now, which is nine school districts. And so um, through that uh, method, uh, we will have a place for uh, meeting material needs, things like food and clothing and that kind of stuff, obviously. Uh, but more importantly, uh, relational connections, uh, parenting uh, classes, financial resources, financial literacy, uh, child camps, child mentoring. A uh, big piece of what we do is addiction recovery. Uh, it's a community for folks that are in active recovery for addiction. And so uh, we feel like if we can get a movement of churches that are uh, connected with that idea, we believe we've got a model um, that's reproducible uh, and we've got great energy. So our second site opened this fall. We're working on our third site now. We've got five churches in the community just to the north of us that have signed up and said we'd like to do it. And so we're, we're engaging on a... Uh, uh, on, on a growth model now to, to move the church that way. Uh, thank you so much, Kevin, for taking time to do this, and uh, uh, good, good luck on your sermon tomorrow. <laughs> Thanks, Cody.